course. <clears throat> Father, we bless you mm. and we lift up your people uh, in our hearts before you. you. Mm. And uh, but we don't do so in desperation as much as we do in a, a trust in the love that you have for your people. And, uh, Lord, this is how we're able to come before you as our father mm. and also as our, our great shepherd and our king. Mm. And Lord, it is a beautiful thing to realize that we, uh, do not approach you as others would approach kings of the world mm. in a, a kind of uh, groveling supplication. Mm. Lord, you most certainly have a, a, uh, a system of honor and mm. uh, a an environment of holiness that is to be kept pure. Mm. Um, but Lord, the, the fear of the Lord is a, Lord, a thing that inspires us to, to live lives of worship before you. Mm. And, uh, but rather than disabling us, it, uh, it enables us to uh, to rise as sons in your house. Mm. Well, this is um, this is a place of humility, and mm. uh, we thank you for the many ways in which you do humble us. Mm. And we ask that you would continue to do so, Father. Mm. If there's any uh, unclean thing in us that would continue to try to exalt itself. Mm. Um, Lord, I, in, in keeping your people in prayer, I, mm. I uh, pray for the advancement of your work in every family mm. and in each life of each family. Mm. And, Lord, we desire to be ready to <laughs> do whatever you would have us do mm. in the lives of others around us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord, in order to get to that place, we have to overcome mm. those spirits that we constantly battle against, mm. familiarity and mm. religion. Mm. And uh, Lord, this is... Uh, becoming more and more um, noticeable on the spiritual radar of each person. Mm. Lord, as we uh, become less blind to mm. those insidious things mm. and uh, are therefore uh, better suited to, to battle against them mm. and expose them mm. and call them out for what they are. Mm. And uh, Lord, we will continue to to fight, Father. Mm. And, uh, we will not uh, shy away from uh, every battle that you step before us. Mm. Uh, every chance that you give us to overcome. Mm. And uh, Lord, we just. We thank you for, for everything, Father, mm. and mm. pray this in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Noah. In all the things, I see a willing heart. <laughs> Want to do things excellently and right in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, see mm. your growth. You know, so see you're always uh, encouraged in the Lord. I see a lot of prudence 
wisdom and insight then as you you move in the lord move in relationships you know so <laughs> the thing about in the beginning in case young people start <laughs> i remember the pressure in your hand now nah, there's a lot of confidence and freedom grew up in you the good ones you know so yeah not self-assumed ones so um may the lord continue to bless your investment your leadership in the midst of your generation so okay so Absolutely. yeah Amen. let's uh Move on here with the reading on the book of Alexander McLaren's book, Exposition of Holy Scriptures. We're on the book of Isaiah. We're in the portion, the titles for the suffering servant. I think that's dash I means part of one, guys. Scripture reference is 53, 2 and 3. For he grew up before him. As a tender plant, wow. Hmm. As a root of the dry ground, as a no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. To hold fast the fulfillment of this prophecy as a suffering servant in Jesus, it is not necessary to deny it's a reference to Israel as, as offices, institutions, and persons in it were prophetic and by their failures to realize to the full, the full own role, no less than by their partial presentation of it, pointed onwards to him in whom their idea would finally take form and Satan. So this great picture of God's servant, which was but imperfectly reproduced even by the Israel within Israel, stood on the prophet page, a fair Though sand the dream was nothing corresponding to it in the region of reality and history till he came and lived and suffered. If we venture to make it the theme for the short series of sermons, our object is simply to endeavor to bring out clearly the features of a wonderful portrait. If they are fully apprehended, it seemed to us that the question of who is the original of the picture answers itself. We must note that the whole is introduced by the four. That is to say, it is all explanatory of the unbelief and blindness to the revealed arm of the Lord, which is a prophet and thus being lamenting. This close connection with the preceding words accounts for the striking way in which the description of the person of the servant is here blended ways or interrupted by that of the manner in which he was treated. 1. The servant's lowly origin and the growth. He grew, and the shall grow. The whole is cast into the form of history. And to begin the description with a future tense that is not only an error in grammar but a grand teachersly introduce a incongruity. The word rendered tender plant means a sucker and root properly would be properly be taken as a shoot from a root. The tree having been felt and nothing left but a stump. There it is here. There is here, then, at the outset, an unmistakable reference to the prophecy in chapter 11, 1, which messianic prophecy, therefore, there is a presumption that uh, this too has a messianic reference. In the original passage, the stump or stock explained as being the humidity horse of David 
It's only following the indication supplied by the fact that the second is uh, as a quotation of the first. If we take the implication in the words to be the same, royal descent, but from a royal horse falling on evil days, is the plain meaning here. At the exclusive of this, its glory is a further brought out in that not only does the shoot of spring from a tree. All whose love, leafy honors, have long been lopped away, but which is in a dry ground. Surely we do not force a profounder meaning than is legitimate into this feature of the picture when we think of the carpenter's psalm of the horse and lineage of David, of the son of God, was found in fashion as a man, of him. Was born in a stable, and grew up in a tiny village hidden away among the hills of Galilee. Who, as it were, stole into the world not with observation, and opened out as he grew the wondrous blossom of a perfect humanity such as had never been before, had never before been evolved from any root. No groom on the most sedulously cultured planned. Is this part of the prophet's ideal realized in any of the other such realizations of it? But there is still another point in regard to the origin and the growth of the lowly shoot from the felled stump. It is before him. Then the unnoticed growth is noticed by Jehovah. And so cared for by no others, is a cared for, tended and tended, and guarded by him. Two, the servants are attractive form. Naturally, should a spring from a springing in a dry ground, would show but little beauty of a flourish or flower. It would be styled the colorless besides. The God of growth is in fertile, well-watered gardens, but that unattractiveness is not absolutely a real. It is not absolute a real. It is only that we should desire Him, but the poor judges of true form or commonness. What is luxurious with the perfect beauty in God's eye may be, and generally is, plain and dowdy. In man's, our tastes are debased, floating vulgarities and self-asserting arguments captive, captivate vulgar eyes to which the serene beauties of mere goodness seem insipid. What cockatoos? What how to say that word? Cockatoos, cockatoos, I guess. Can you help me? <laughs> Cockatoos.、Mm -hmm. I think it's cockatoos. Cockatoos. What that even is, man? Sorry. <laughs> Let me see. Some、okay. kind of bird. Some kind of birds. Okay. Oh, see, it's like a, a what is called it? The pick, not pick up. What is called? Forget about this.、Oh. A parrot. A parrot. Yeah, it's like a, it says a parrot actually.、Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> cockatoos. Okay. In Australian, it's the Indonesia. Okay, so. That's interesting. Cactus charm savages to whom the resident neck of a dove has no charms. Surely this part of the description fits Jesus as it does no other. The entire absence of outward show, but of all them places, the spoiled taste of a sinful man need not be dwelt upon. No doubt, the world has slowly come to recognize in him the more ideal, a perfect man. But it has been educated for nineteen hundred years to get it up to that point, and the educational process is very far from complete. The real desire for most men is for something much more poignant and dashing than Jesus' meek wisdom and stainless purity, which breed in them. Inuai rather than longing, 
Is that how to pronounce that word? That's the first time I've heard it. You know why, what that means. Um, I think it's ennui. Ennui. It boredom. Oh, boredom. Okay. Ennui. Ennui. So, yes, you are right. Which breeding them ennui rather than lime. No, this man, but the Brabus was the approximate realization of the Jewish ideals then. Not this man, but some type or other of a less oppressive profession and calls for less effort to imitate it is the world's real cry still. Pilots gone for wondering question, Ah, that's such a poor-looking creature, the king of the Jews. It's very much the, of a piece with the world question still. Are those the perfect instant for manhood? Are those the highest revelation of God? 3. The servant's reception by man. The two preceding characteristics naturally result in this third. Below in this condition, a lack of qualities appealing to man's false ideals will certainly lead to being despised and rejected. The land expression is probably better taken as in the margin of uh, the revised version as a forsaken. But whichever meaning is adopted, what an alien of woes, it's condensed into those two words, the spurn that a patient merit of the unworthy takes, the loneliness of one who in all the crown desire uh, de describes, sorry, in all the crowd describes none to trust. These are the wishes that the world ever gives to its noblest, who live to help it, and be misunderstood by it. And these are the wishes of all who, with a self devotion, would serve God by serving the world for its good. They are paid in large measure to the servant of the Lord. His claims were ridiculed, his words of wisdom thrown back on himself. None were so poor, but could afford to despise him as a lower. And they, his love was repulsed. Surely he drank the bitterest cup of content. All his life, he walked in the solitude of uncomprehended aims, at his hour of extremest need, appealed in vain for a little solace of companionship. I was deserted by those whom he trusted most. He was was a lifelong martyrdom inflicted by men. His was a lifelong solitude which was the most utter and the lust. And he brought it all on himself because he would be God's servant in being man's sewer. For the servant's sorrow of heart. Remarkable expression acquainted with grave seemed to carry allusion to the previous clause. In which man has spoken love and despising and rejecting servants, they, they left him alone. His only companion was a grief, a grim associated to walk at a man's side all his days. It will be noticed that the word rendered grief is literally sickness. That description of mental or spiritual sorrows under the imagery of a bodily sickness. Is intensified in the subsequent terrible picture of him as one from whom men hide their faces with disgust and is a hideous appearance caused by disease. Probably, possibly, the meaning may rather be than that he hides his face as the lepers had to do. Now, probably the sorrows touched on and this point are to be distinguished from those which Subsequently, I spoken of in terms of such poignancy as laid on the servant by God. Here, the private is thinking rather of those 
who fall on him by reason of man's rejection and desertion. We shall not rightly esteem the sorrowfulness of Christ's sorrows unless we bring to our meditation, meditations on them the other thoughts of his joys. How great this work we can judge when we remember that he told the disciples that by his joy remaining in them, their joy would be full. As much joy as, as a human nature was capable of from perfect purity, filial obedience, trust, and unbroken communion with God, so much was Jesus' permanent experience. The golden cup of his pure nature was ever full to the brim with the richest wine of joy. And that constant experience of gladness in the Father and in himself made it more painful the sorrows which he encountered, like abiding wind shrieking shrieking around him whenever he passed out from fellowship with God in the stillness of soul into the contemptuous and the hostile world. If the spirit carried with it the still and the must fail of the holy place would feel more kingly than any other would have done the jarring tumult of the crowds and would know a sharper pen and met with the greetings in which was no kindness. This was a sinless. The sympathy with all sorrow was thereby rendered abnormally keen, and he made others grief his own with the identification born of a, a sympathy which the most compassionate cannot attain. The greater the love, the greater the sorrow of the loving heart when it's love. Is a spurned. The intenser the yearning for companionship, the sharper the pen it is repulsed. The more one longs to bless, the more one suffers with the blessings are flung off. This adds the most sensitive and the most sympathetic, the most longing soul that will dwell in flesh is soul, as neither has ever seen man's miseries, experience and none else has ever experienced man's ingratitude and therefore the God, even his God, annoyed him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. And he was a man of sorrows and grief was his companion. During all his life course, I want to read on um, this portion, okay, the suffering serving portion. So, it's the second part. The scripture is again Isaiah 53 now, 4 to 6. Surely hands borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did not esteem stricken, smitten with God. We did esteem stricken, smitten God, and afflicted. But it was wounded for our transgressions, as a bruise for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like a sheep are gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid made light on him the iniquity of us all. The no struck light today in the close of the preceding paragraph becomes dominant here. One notes the accumulation of suppressions for suffering. Crowd into this verses of graves, of sorrows, of wounded, of bruised, smitten, chastisement, stripes. One knows that the cause of all this multiform infliction is a given the like emphasis of reiteration, our graves, our sorrows, and then these afflictions are invested with a still more tragic and mysterious aspect by being traced to our transgressions, our iniquities. Finally, the deepest word of all is spoken when the whole mystery of the certain sufferings refer to Jehovah's making the universe, the universal iniquity to lie like a crushing burden upon him. 
one, the burdened servant. It is to be kept in view with the grief to which the servant is here described as a bearing a, as a bearing are literally sicknesses. And then similarly, the sorrows may be diseases. Matthew is a quotation of the worse. That is, 8, 17, takes the words to refer to bodily ailments and found the fulfillment in Christ's miracles of healing. And that interpretation, part of the whole truth for Hebrew, uh, Hebrew thought, draw no such a sharp line of distinction between diseases of the body and those of the soul, as we are accustomed to draw. All sickness are taken to be the consequence of a sin, and the intimate connection between the two was, as it were, set forth for all forms of body disease by the elaborate treatment prescribed for leprosy and preemptively fated to stand as a type of the whole. The fulfillment through the miracle is but a parable of a, a deeper fulfillment in regard to the more virulent and the diseases of the soul. Sin is a sickness. It is also the grave which most afflicts humanity. Of the two words expressing the servant taking the burden on his shoulders, the former implies not only the taking of it, but the bearing of it away. And the latter emphasizes, emphasizes the weight of the load. Following Matthew's lead, we may regard Christ's miracles of healing as one form of his fulfillment of the prophets, in which the principle that is shape all the forms are and a work, which therefore may stand as a kind of a pictorial illustration of the way in which it bears and bears away the heavy burden of sin. And one point which comes out clearly that in this act of healing, he felt the weight of the affliction that it took away. Even in that region, the condition of ability to remove it was identify himself with the sorrow. Did he not sigh and look up in silent appeal to heaven before he could say, Epaphatha? Epaphatha. How do you pronounce that? I've heard that before. I forgot about it. Epaphatha. Yeah. Okay. Ephratha. Ephratha. Yeah, that's right. Dude. That's right. Yeah. Ephratha. Ephratha. Did he not groom himself before he set the voice into the tomb which the dead heard? His miracles were not easy. So he had all power and he felt all that the sufferers felt. But the identifying power of the unparalleled sympathy of a pure nature. In that region, his pen, on account of the sufferers, stood in wider relation with the power to end their sufferings. The load must go his shoulders, Era, he could have bared it away from theirs. But the same principles as applied to these deeds of mercy done on diseases applied to all his deeds of deliverance from sorrow and from sin. In him set forth in highest fashion the condition for all brotherly help and the elevation. El- elevation, elevation. Whoever would lighten a brother load must stoop his own shoulders to carry it. While there is element in our Lord's sufferings, as the test passes on to say, which is not explained by the analogy which was what is required from all humans, golf, skull, uh, what are they, sakuras and hilas, the extent to which the Lord experiences such corresponds with his unique work should always be made prominent in our devout meditations. Two, the servants of suffering in the reason, their intensity and their insight. The same measure that was meted out to Job, that is so called the friends, the measure to the servant that is the impulse, the same heartless 
doctrinal proposition. He must have been hand to suffer so much as that is the rough, ready work of the self righteousness, the self righteous, with the crushing emphasis that a complacent explanation of the certain suffering, their own prosperity is assured, showered to Adams by the statement of the true reason for both the one and the other. You saw that he was afflicted because he was banned, and you were spared because you were good. No, he was afflicted because you were banned, and you were spared because he was afflicted. The reason for the servants' of suffering was our transgressions. Morris says now, then some pathetic identification with the others of sorrow. This is actual bearing of the consequences of sins which he had not committed, and that not merely as innocent man may be overwhelmed by the flood of evil which has been let loose by others' sin to sweep over the earth. The blow that wounds him is struck directly and solidly at him. It is not entangled in a widespread calamity. But is the only victim. It is presupposed, and all transgression leads to wounds and bruises. But the transgressions was done by us, and the wounds and bruises fall on him. Can the idea of who carry on suffering be more plainly set forth? The intensity of the servants of suffering is brought home to our hearts by the accumulation. Of effects to which reference had already been made. He was wounded as one who is pierced by a sharp sword, bruised as one who is stoned to death, beaten and with livid veils on his flesh. A background of our name, the prosecutors dimly seem. The description moves altogether in the region of physical violence. And that violence is more than simple. There's no, no mere coincidence that it's the story of the passion reproduces so many of the details of the prophecy. For although the fulfillment of the lantern does not depend on such coincidences, they are not to be passed by as of no importance. Former generations made too much of the physical sufferings of Jesus. Is not this generation in danger of making too little of them? The issue of the servants of suffering is a presenting a startling paradox. Is the bruises and wounds are the causes of our being healed? In the chastisement brings our peace. Surely it is a very hard work and needs much forcing of words, much determination, not to be seen. Not to see what is set forth in set forth in as a plain light, as can be conceived, to strike the idea of atonement of this prophecy. He says as emphatically as the words can say that we have by our sin deserved stripes, and that the servant bear the stripe which we have deserved, and that therefore. We do not bear them. Three, the deepest ground of the seven sufferings. The sad picture of humanity painted in that simple, uh, in that simile of a scattered flock, lays stress on the universality of a transgression, by its divisive effect on the solitude of sin. And on its essential characteristic as being self-willed rejection for control, but the isolation caused by transgressions is blessedly counteracted by the concentration of the sin of all on the servant, man fighting for their own hand, a living at their own pleasure, a working to the disruption of all sweet bonds of fellowship. But God, in needing together all the black burden to one. A loading the servant with that tremendous weight is a preparing for the establishment of a more blessed unity in experience of the healing brought about by his sufferings.
Can one man's iniquity and distinguish from the consequences of iniquity be made to press upon any other? It is a familiar and not very profound objection to the Christian atonement that guilt cannot be transferred. Guilt cannot be transferred. True, but in the first place, Christ's nature stands in wider relations to every man, with such intimacy. That was impossible between two of us. Is not impossible between Christ and any one of us. And secondly, much in his life, still more in the passion. His unintelligible against the black mass of the wall sin was heaped upon him to his own consciousness. In a dread cry, wrung from him as he hung there in the dark. The consciousness, the consciousnesses of possessing God and of having lost Him, are blended inextricably, inexplicably. The only approach to an explanation of it is that then the world sin was felt by Him in all its terrible mess and blackness, coming between Him and God. Even as our own sin scheme separating us from God, you know, it was said there was a eclipse, some solar eclipse at the time, you know. So, you know, so the whole world fell into darkness for three hours in the afternoon. Then green burden not only came upon him, but was laid upon him by God. The same idea is expressed by the prophet in an awful representation, and by Jesus that is, as awful cry, "Why hast thou forsaken me?" The prophet constructed no theory for atonement, but no language could be chosen that would more plainly set forth the fact of atonement. It is to be observed that, as far as this prophet is concerned, The servant's sole form of service is to suffer. He is not the teacher, an example, or the benefactor in any of the other ways in which man needs help. His work is to bear our graves and be bruised for our healing. He was oppressed, yet he humbled himself to open not his mouth, as a lamb that led to the slaughter. And a sheep that before her shearers is dumb, yet opened not his mouth. By oppression, judgment he was taken away. As for his generation, for among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked. With the rich in his death, though although it had done no violence, neither was any deceit in the mouth. Isaiah fifty-three, seven to nine. I think that's a continuous in the next portion.、Um, <coughs> today, however, let's ramp up here next time to read on this、uh, wonderful chapter. So. Wow, what a blessing! I was thinking about this stuff recently because <laughs> Passover season stuff, then so Easter season. So, Amen, Hallelujah.、Mm-hmm. Why not you wrap up for us, Noah?、Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, when I consider the suffering servant, when I think of what you call each one of your sons to be. And Father, we understand that the crucifixion that is to take place in the inner man is—it's、uh, not a one-time event, Father, but it's the very foundation of our spiritual life. But it's what enables us to 
step into a new way of living and just in that sense a a portal into spiritual life Lord for that has been a, a pattern in creation mm. from the very beginning of time that mm. death is required for life mm. and this is no different in the spiritual realm mm. and uh Lord, surely the suffering that we go through is but a, a small shade of that blackness mm. and darkness that you encountered mm. and uh, suffered. Mm. But Lord, we, we don't desire to go through our sufferings with a, a sense of uh, heroism mm. or in light of what we are and are not able to bear. Mm. Lord, we, we want to understand it as a, a gift from you, mm. Lord. Um, because every, every trial is a, a chance to, to grow. It's a chance to, uh, tear down anything that obstructs the the flow of your light mm. and life and truth mm. into our lives. Mm. And uh, mm. Lord, we have, I don't think we pray this very often, but mm. Lord, we, we want to be careful and uh, not hindering the work this work that you do in the lives of those that we love. Mm. And, uh, Lord, when we see you uh, pressing hard on a soul, mm. uh, Lord, may we not let our affection and our mm. pity mm. get in the way of that. Mm. Lord, Lord, give us that insight and that wisdom. Mm. And, uh, may we nonetheless, uh, never fail to be, that uh, rock for mm. the, the person mm. that is uh, suffering mm. or you are the, the true foundation for every soul and every spirit mm. uh, but Lord we want to emulate our father mm. in uh, being reliable and mm. uh, trustworthy for for those that do uh, mm. undergo trials of many kinds mm. and so mm. Lord I pray even for myself that I would grow in that capacity mm. um, to mm. to practice true empathy mm. towards other lives mm. um, and Lord, I, I want this to be inspired by more than a human affection, mm. but by mm. the the loving kindness that your mm. spirit uh, can well up within us mm. for another life. Mm. And uh, Lord, we we thank you, Father, for your love, mm. which is beyond. Uh, expression mm. Uh, mm. Well, it certainly can be expressed but <laughs> mm. it's a uh, mm. it's ineffable it can't be expressed in words mm. and Lord this is the beautiful thing about it is mm. it's meant to be expressed in, in life mm. and in mm. in relationship and so Lord we mm. bless your people in this and mm. thank you for those that that do know your love and mm. pursue your love and pursue others in your love mm. and pray these things in Jesus name. In Amen. Jesus name. I see Charlie in the foe. Okay, so yeah.
right. 11.30? <laughs> 11.30 it is. Uh, yeah. All right. Oh, bless you, Noah. See you shortly. Okay. Bless you too. Okay. okay, bye. Bless Thank you. you. Yeah. Bye. Okay.